Thank you. Closing the case for proposition, we have Kate Smurfway. Kate Smurfway is a left-wing comedian and political activist. She performs stand-up comedy around the UK and is currently touring on her 16th one-woman show, Humanity's Last Hope. Her campaign work has included almost a decade as a spokesperson for Abortion Rights UK, and she frequently works with female asylum seekers. Kate Smurfway, you have the ear of the house. Thank you very much. And may I start by saying, welcome to communism. Um, as you may be aware, speakers at the Cambridge Union are not paid, so all of the people here in front of you are giving their time and energy completely for free, um, because out of the goodness of their heart, because they want to help or support for the sake of their own ego, for fun or possibly for the meal with which we were provided, and I might add that we were each provided to according to our needs. Um, I know a few of our previous speakers seem to think that I'm here to defend Lenin or Trotsky or something like that, which is a little bit like uh, condemning Star Wars because you didn't like Jar Jar. It comes as no surprise to me that a perfectly good idea can be screwed up by a handful of predominantly white men. I could provide a counterexample and list some places where capitalism has failed, for example, 21st century Britain. And I would note, actually, that 21st century Britain has seen leadership from both people of colour and from women, and it would seem as though capitalism can steer us into the gutter under a wide range of leadership. So I should be clear that I am not here to advocate for communism. I am here to advocate for something very specific that I believe still has the potential to work, and that is communism led by black women. Most people in this room have been taught that free markets mean that you will be compensated for your labour. But in actual fact, the vast majority of useful labour that takes place around the world is not paid. The caring work that goes on all around the world, providing and preparing food, building and maintaining homes, the vast majority of that is done unpaid overwhelmingly by women and by people of colour. The vast majority of paid work on the other hand, contributes absolutely nothing to our society. Any of you planning to leave this institution and go on to work in accountancy, in legal work, for an insurance company, or in managing parking, or in vigilating exams, or anything like that, will effectively be simply fidgeting around deciding where the spoils of other people's labour should, uh, should be shared more or less fairly among the rest of our society. I'm all right, thanks. Tonight, uh, you may also have been taught that the spoils of the free market are choice. The reality is that that is only true for a tiny, tiny minority of us. The vast majority experience the spoils of the free market as nothing more than the basics, if they are very lucky, necessities that they need for their lives. And you might think that because you're sat here, you're among that small privileged few who will get to enjoy the luxury of choice, and you might do. But let me remind you that the seas are rising. The ground is genuinely slipping away from underneath our feet. And at any moment, even the most privileged among us can find ourselves lying on our back, shouting, a horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. Femi mentioned the US healthcare system, or as it's also known, where we will be headed in the next six to 12 months unless some sort of serious revolution gets afoot. Under the US healthcare system, the current state of affairs in the US, 75% of home repossessions in the US are directly related to medical costs. And in more than half of those, they are for people who did have insurance, but the insurance ran out, didn't cover certain conditions, and every single one of us in this room value our lives ahead of our homes. So that comes as absolutely no surprise. As soon as we are to allow healthcare to fall into the hands of the free market, we are putting a price on every single person's head. And that's a price which ultimately can be extracted from you. And it means that all of us become commodities, disposable commodities. And I personally think that is a disgusting way to treat people. Let me refer to democracy, which is the other part of what we're talking about today. Democracy should be about the best ideas rising to the surface, being spread around. But in fact, because of the free market, 
what we actually experience is that the ideas that are spread around are those that are the most profitable to propagate, to those that propagate them, whether that's junk TV, selling schmaltzy stories that aren't really based in truth, or whether that's the free market selling itself back to us like some sort of horrendous Ponzi scheme. Go on then. There is nobody I can vote for that will take, that will, well, I mean, we'll get to democracy in a second, but there is nobody I can vote for that will take junk TV off my screen. It will always be there. It will always be there. And yes, of course, you can. On the contrary, you absolutely can't. You go into get a drink somewhere and you will find the TV is on. Yeah, I, if you want to live your life free of TV, you, you, you absolutely can't. I will talk to you briefly about how I've gotten fairly close to doing so. But, um, but uh, I think I'm good. Um, uh, right, where am I? I? actually need my glasses, don't I? Right, good. Okay. Truth is that the vast majority of, this peop of people who do support free markets in this room do so because you essentially have not really been exposed or, or, or like, led to, le taught about very much else. So I want to take you somewhere a long way away from that, away from the influence of TV. I spent a part of last summer in the desert at Wadi Rum in Jordan uh, with a Bedouin tribesman um, and... While I was out there, he turned to me and he asked me, because I, I have, as you've probably picked up, a, a sort of a bad girl vibe going on. Um, he asked me whether I had ever been to prison. And, uh, and I said, no, I've, I've never been to prison. And in, as a kind of semi-joke, I said that they never caught me. Um, and he said, what did you do? Did you rob a bank? And my instinct was to say, no, I've never robbed a bank. But then I thought about it and I said, no, I, I have robbed a bank. Um, I, I worked briefly for a bank when I finished at university and I took a lot of pens from that stationery cupboard. Um, so I said, I have robbed a bank, uh, but only pens. Um, and then I said, but on the other hand, financial markets go up and down. Your money in the bank could be worth nothing tomorrow. You know, it's not what's important to you, but we'll always need pens. And he looked at me like I was an idiot. Like, I was saying the stupidest thing he had ever heard in his life, and he said, we don't need pens. And I think that we need to start looking at things in a completely different and completely radical way. The truth is that the vast majority of what you have been taught here at Cambridge is entirely useless. All it serves to do is reinforce hierarchies that actually don't help anybody and don't serve anyone. Almost everything you've been taught here is entirely pointless. I will make a brief exception if you happen to be a postdoctoral neuroscientist. It's, it's, it's a lot better at Oxford. If, however, if, however, you insist on believing it, if you accept this notion that somehow what has brought you here and what you've been taught here furnishes our society with a collection of the greatest minds among it, then isn't it somewhat devastating to realise that those brilliant, brilliant, super-educated minds have spent three hours bickering about the meaning of words and some historical data that doesn't prove anything about what might or might not happen in the future? For all the chatter and clever points and snarky remarks, not a single mouth has been fed as a result of our dialogue this evening, except, I might add, mine. So in conclusion, thank you for the dinner, and may you all go to hell.